have us all welcome him together. So thank you. Mm -hmm. well, thanks very much, uh, Andrew. Uh, thank you, thank you all for coming. Um, so today we're go uh, uh, trying a, a, a mild experiment because uh, Maureen is very kindly joining me on this slightly madcap journey where she will she'll be sketching as we go along, and um, we're we're trying to see if there's some something that can come out of this conversation between uh, text and visuals and stuff. So she's also brought extra index cards, so if anyone wants to join in, you know, by all means. Um, um, and then I think after, after, after we do that, we, we're going to try to compile it together and, and see what happens from that. Um, uh, yeah. But, um, so I'm just going to, I'm just sort of, ah, what if I can do? Um, so yeah, I'm just going to start, uh, and, and we'll just take it from there. Um, I would like to to begin to open and by saying or declaring, confessing perhaps that I'm about to speak about, have already started speaking of things of people that I know very little of. Uh, for there is indeed very little about science that I know, less even of scientists and perhaps even less about the Siddhar Shang. Um, so perhaps an opening that asks for, that requests your, your indulgence. But perhaps also an excuse that comes a little too late. After all, I have already begun. At least in terms of words, scribbles or marks. Not that we can quite know when we actually ever begin. After all, I might have already started this the moment I agreed to come to, to be here. The moment I responded to Mario's uh, initial, very kind, deeply generous invitation to speak on something. A something that neither of us had quite known at the point of agreement. Or at the moment of the touch of the handshake of what it was or what it might be. Or if it might even amount to anything. Uh, perhaps then I should have begun by asking to begin again. Not that one can quite go back in time at least not in any known way, but that we might open ourselves to the possibility of having multiple tracks in time, keeping in mind that I'm currently in at least two time zones, in my head. <laughs> perhaps then having times that open us to, in Isabel Stengus's words, a weaving of regenerative, slightly transgressive imaginations. So perhaps as a, as a sort of a third beginning, one that attempts to interweave my attempts to speak as an amateur, with double, triple, multiple times that I'm reading Stengus's text in, without quite bringing them together, without flattening the singularity of love and the multiplicities of engagement across particular times into one, perhaps you will allow me to open our ears to the tune that was playing in my head for reasons that still escape me. The very first time and each and every time I listen to Stengus's speech, Cosmopolitics, learning to live, to think with sciences, peoples, and natures, which I am now trying to respond to. And in her spirit, perhaps the question is not so much what the tune signifies, what Tracy Bonham might mean, but its relevance, its effects. After all, there is a possibility that tunes, like ideas, have an efficacy of their own, to poison or to activate, to close or to open possibilities. A song which opens the question, or at least a possible question for us. Why twice? Why the invocation of mother twice over? Or even, why call out to two mothers? Perhaps here we might consider the notion that we have, or we always already have two mothers. The one from whom, through whom we arrive, and the one that we call the maternal, the woman. The woman and the mother. Not necessarily separate, but perhaps never quite the same. And since these thoughts are coming through one who calls, who names himself as answers the call of being Southeast Asian, perhaps we might consider the possibility that they are same, same, but different. <laughs> Where mother is the one that watches over you, that cares for you, that pays attention to you. Which is precisely what Isabel Stenger says Gaia is not. For her, Gaia is the name of a very ancient divinity a Greek divinity, much older than the anthropomorphic gods and goddesses of the Greek cities. It may be that she was a figure of the mother, 
but then not of a nice loving mother, rather of an awesome one, who should not be offended, also a rather indifferent one, with no particular interest in the fate of her offspring. <coughs> Gaia is this figure of the many-figured earth which demands neither love, more protection, but the kind of attention to be paid to a pretty, powerful being. And more than that, for attending to Stengus's teaching here, to name is a pragmatic operation, the truth of which is in its effects. Thus Gaia is an unknown mother, a potentially unknowable mother, yet one that we have to pay attention to, attend to, and attempt to respond to. A mother that is a trace, an echo, perhaps always already the second mother, as it were, and also a name which names nothing except the fact that it is naming. But perhaps, before we attempt to unravel the mysteries of Gaia, keeping in mind that true mysteries make us tremble, we should turn our attention to the situation of her talk, her speech, particularly since specificity is crucial to Stengus. So even as we might be reading her, or reading a reading of her as it were, we should try not to forget that Stengus was attempting to address an audience composed of those familiar with science, with the sciences of the Thus, it was not so much the content of a speech that is, that is important, which is not to say that what she says isn't important, wasn't illuminating, far from it, but that we should pay attention to the effects of it. The manner in which she was attempting to affect those who had listened were presumably listening. Where what she was attempting to do was to lead her listeners down a particular path. And here we should open the dossier of pedagogy, particularly the registers that the teacher, the pedagogue, can only guide, lead the ones being taught. And teaching is not a direct transference of information or even knowledge, but a leading by example. Where the habits of the teacher, and by extension the teacher's body, is the very site of the teaching. Which is why Martin Heidegger teaches us that the real teacher, in fact, lets nothing be learned, else be learned than learning. His conduct, therefore, often produces the impression that we properly, learn, we properly learn nothing from him, if by learning we now suddenly understand that merely the procurement of useful information. The teacher is ahead of his apprentices in this alone, that he has still far more to learn than they. He has to learn to let them learn. The teacher must be capable of being more teachable than the apprentices. The teacher is far less assured of his ground than the, those who are of theirs. Thus the teacher and the student are in a relationality where they are open to the possibility of learning. And where this learning takes place is on and in their bodies. Where what Stengus is attempting to do is to open a relation with her audience, recalling her notion that the making of a relation is not the recognition that we are related. It is an achievement, which implies the risk of failure, the hesitation between war and peace. A relationality that doesn't assume its own relation. One in which the one who is leading is not only willing to be lost, but to be led by the very ones she is leading. Where being led astray is not just a possibility, but will always remain a potentiality. Not because of misdirection, for if there is no known tellers, no known goal, one can never know if one ever reaches a destination, gets there. But because this uncertainty is written into every journey, every path, every hodus. The same unknowability that haunts every method, every method holds. In other words, a relationality that is offered, a relationality that cannot exist before being written into being, which also means that this relationality is one that has no legitimacy, no room, quite possibly no possibility of verification. A writing that is a reading of, it is reading, the possibility of relationality between the two or more things, beings, brought into relation with each other as the relation is being written. Which is why Stengus calls for witnessing, calls for, to borrow her terms, experts, diplomats, and victims to testify to the relationship between themselves. And here, perhaps at the risk of being unfaithful to Stengus's project of being constructivist, pragmatist, speculative, of responding with infidelity to her spirit even, we should not close ourselves to the teachings of Jacques Derrida on testimony, on witnessing. In particular, that fictionality is both the condition and the very limit of testimony. That without the possibility of fiction, 
there will not be the possibility of testifying to one's experience. As Derrida testifies, testimony always goes hand in hand with at least the possibility of fiction, perjury, lie. With this possibility to be eliminated, no testimony would be possible any longer. It could not have the meaning of testimony. However, the essence of testimony cannot necessarily be reduced to narration, that is, to description, informative relations, to knowledge, or to narrative. It is first a present act. And since it has to be a present act, this suggests that in order to testify to an experience, one has to have first lived through it. Thus, all testimony occurs through memory. However, since one has no control nor access to forgetting, it happens to one, one can never be certain not only if one has forgotten anything in the testimony by way of omission, one can also never quite know if every act of memory entails or brings with it forgetting, which might also be why they can be unknowingly false or even true testimonies. Or perhaps more aptly, that one can never be fully certain or even aware of the truth or falsity of one's testimony. Moreover, since there is no or at least no known limit to the number of testimonies that one can offer regarding a particular event, this suggests that it is precisely forgetting itself that allows this to happen. It is the impossibility of verification that allows for each and every testimony. Which suggests that the risk of testimony, of testifying, is that one is not responding reading, but instead writing the object of testimony into being, making it speak for one, speak only because one is speaking through it, making it say what one wants it to say. Perhaps then all that one can know is that one is testifying. Perhaps all one can ever do is to name one's testimony as testimony, keeping in mind that to name is always a way to to prepare for the absence of the one that's being named, to prepare for the moment in which all that can be uttered is her, his, its name, for the moment of its, his, her death. In, order, in other words, to call one's testimony a testimony, to name it as such, is always to pre also to prepare for the moment when it testifies to nothing, a moment perhaps when victims, diplomats, experts, are testifying to nothing except for the fact that they are testifying, that even as they are named testifiers, that even as they testify, their testes have been cut off. However, even as we tune our ears to Derrida, we should also not forget, not wash our hands off Stengus' statement that she is not doing a critical deconstruction. For even if factually justified, Deconstruction fails from the pragmatic speculative point of view, from the point of view of its effects, leaving us with a more desolate, empty world. Thus, I have to acknowledge, bear responsibility, a notion clearly dear to strangers, to the fact, or at least the possibility, that I am misreading her. Which is not to say, if one, take, if one is to take seriously the notion that reading is an openness to the possibility of another, that one can necessarily distinguish with any certainty a legitimate from an illegitimate reading. But perhaps this is the very site of responsibility itself, the acknowledgement that all readings are one's readings, readings that one has written, are always potentially illegitimate, readings that cannot count on any authority, cannot count on daddy for legitimacy, readings that can only know who mommy is. But perhaps this is precisely what saves the readings, the writings of these readings, relationality itself and certainty, from being set in stone, which are the very things that Stengus is warning us about. For in her words, I vitally need a dream, such a story which never happened. A dream of vitality, energy, movement, a dream about possibilities, a dream in which the effects are a positive, radical plurality of sciences, each particular scientific practice answering the challenge of relevance associated with its field. And in her vital dream, one can hear the whisperings of Nietzsche, in particular his gay scientist, the joyful tester who continues testing, testing the very test itself, never settling on an answer, never allowing an answer to settle. <coughs> For what keeps movement, life, vitality is precisely uncertainty, the possibilities that fictionality opens to another tale, another story. 
And in speaking about religions, a register that should not be foreign to our dossier of missing paternity, of the missing father, Nietzsche teaches us that the, mo the moment religion shifts from a movement, from constantly changing, morphing, becoming, into stagnancy, being, dogma, settles into a structure where all vitality and growth are drained from it, it becomes lifeless, dead. And it is precisely the attempt to fully understand the religion, to move it from myths, that which are dynamic, ever-changing, constantly retold, altered, alive, becoming, to a set story, high story, history, linear, predictable, retraceable, uncontaminated by variation, that murders it, that concretizes it into mere orthodoxy. And it is this concretization that Stengus detects, calls out, in the general unilateral authority of science, conquering the world, defining what really matters and what illusory beliefs, and what are only illusory beliefs, blessing the destruction of the new innumerable other ways of relating, knowing, feeling, and interpreting. <coughs> the general who wants to be the leader, to lead his armies, flattening all differences, all otherness, all other possibilities, who wants to be the source of all knowing, all knowledge, daddy, the origin, octa. Which is not to say that Stengus's call for plurality, for possibilities, is one that is devoid of influence, of power. For effects are crucial to her. But here, one should be attentive to Stengus, and bear in mind that it is, not, that it is power that she is speaking of, and not authority. Here one must also try not to forget that power can be contested, challenged, but authority is mystical, divine, also like the realm of human consciousness. It is of the order of the sovereign. One either has authority or one doesn't. And if we take into account the fact that authority has to be granted by another, for the moment a figure of authority uses force, violence, power, her authority vanishes, dissolves. We, can never, we cannot ever know why authority is granted to some and not others. And when we attempt to offer a reason for figures of authority, we, inevit we inevitably turn to, almost as a last resort, notions such as charisma. However, we should bear in mind that charisma is a divine gift. It not only comes from elsewhere, but is always also <coughs> beyond reason, beyond us. Thus, with an origin which origins remain, remain veiled from us, or more than that, an origin whose origins might well have been authored by us. And since the dossier of gifts have been opened, if we pay attention, it is not too difficult to hear echoes of datum, of data resounding, keeping in mind that a datum is an unrequitable gift, thus always also unequitable, uncalculable, unexchangeable. This suggests that data would involve not just the movement of thought, knowledge, but always also brings with it a notion of sharing that is beyond calculability. Therefore, borrowing more contemporary parlance, and here one should remain attentive to time, and how, con how the contemporaneous is not linear, but a rupture in the narrative itself, data and sharing have always been in relation with each other. Data has always already been open source. Which also means that data sharing, transference, always entails an openness to the possibility of another, along with the potentiality for disruption, infection, viruses, distortion. Thus, even as data is shared, what exactly <coughs> is shared remains unknown until the moment it is shared. A, repeti a repetition, a replication that is the same, but might not be quite the same, even if it is recognized, seen as such. Perhaps then, even as we posit that data is shared, what exactly is data might remain veiled from us. For we should not forget that a datum is a gift from a master to a slave, a gift of freedom, always an unequal gift, a gift that never allows the one receiving to forget not just from whom it comes, but also from where the recipient comes, where she stands in that relation. We should also try not to forget that even as the gift might remain an unknowable gift, can we ever know what it means to give freedom to someone? It is past. There is a movement, a trance, transference, quite possibly a translation, transformation of the data from one to another. And the effect is a shift in the status, from a private entity, one within the realm of the home, oikos, to being part of the public, a political entity, to her entering the polis. 
But here we should consider the fact that there is a difference between being part of a polis and becoming part of a community. The former is the relationality of the three, one involving the law, an external force in the relation, whilst the latter, community, is that of two, a relation of change between those involved in the relation, shaping their own relation. Which does not mean that the community has no rules, they certainly do. And these might well be even stricter than in a polis. For one should bear in mind that one can negotiate, bend, play with laws, due to the fact that they are overt, written, shared with all, governed as it were by a third, by something external to the parties involved, the people governed by the law, but with rules, especially since many remain subtle, hidden, covert. There is no space to read, negotiate. One either plays by them or is ejected. However, this does not erase the fact that it is the community itself that determines these rules. And even though one cannot deny that the laws of the land, the surrounding cultures, the polis might have, probably has effects on, even certainly does affect those rules, affects the community, if one is attempting to think with precision, these differences should not be effaced. Whilst this is not the place to attend to that particular question, what is important to us here, what is relevant to the specificity of the space, is that community resounds with echoes of munus, also a gift, but an exchange group, a gift of relation between two or more parties. In this exchange, a symbol is shared between the parties, a symbolum is broken, after which all parties keep a part of it. This token becomes a binding agreement which carries through, moves through generations, and is a watchword for the relationality between these parties, an agreement that brings the parties together, sin, even as they move outwards, bullet, thrown, or cast into the world, where the exchange, the actual object itself, is not so important, but there has to be an object, where the exchange of the gift itself is crucial, which is not to say that this particular exchange is devoid of power as well, but we should bear in mind that the Munos is the foundation of potlatch, where generosity, more precisely performative generosity, ostentatious wastage training, really, functions as a means of putting others in their place. However, this question remains. If a community requires munus, and science is, sciences are, so dependent on data, is the notion of a community of science, a scientific community, possible? To, be, to say no would be rather silly. Of course it is. But perhaps, and this is why Isabel Stengus's address to scientists is important, this community, this communion, resides in the exchange between scientists, resides in scientists themselves rather than science itself. Or at least, that is its promise. And as we speak of promises, we should bear in mind Werner Hamacher's lesson from his beautiful essay, The Promise of Interpretation, that in order to promise, there has to be something that is only to come, something not quite yet, something beyond, where the something that is promised cannot even have the status of a thing, or at least an own thing. Thus, there can never be a reference to the promise, which means that it is an utterance, since it has to be uttered, uttered or would not even exist, without any correspondence. It's catechesis. Which does not mean that it is potentially, which does not only mean that it is potentially always already illegitimate, but that it might well also occur outside of, external to the utterance itself completely other to the very utterance that attempts to give it the status of a promise. As Werner continues, interpretation is never the interpretation of a given other, whether it be a text, a person, a fact, an event, or a history, but it is always the laying out of what it lays itself out in view of something else entirely, where a promise is precisely in its giving, a giving that quite possibly gives without an object, let alone an objective. That thing. But just because there is no necessary object does not mean that there is no recipient. Without someone to receive, accept, acknowledge the giving, there is also no gift. Plus, even, both, even though both Datum and Munus entail power relations, not only is the relationality its premise, the one receiving, the one at the short end of the stick, as it were, is the very condition of this play of power. And here, once again, it is not too difficult to hear echoes of daddy needing his followers in order to be kahuna. 
<laughs> After all, as Neil Gaiman has taught us, without devotees, even gods fade away. But since the relationality between the one giving and the one receiving is not quite so clear, at least not so linear, this suggests that there might be a reversibility in that relation. That at the point of exchange, regardless of its status as Muna Sudhatum, the giver and the one receiving are momentarily exchangeable as well, or at least bound by the giving, quite possibly brought together by what is to be broken. Thus, even as one may think that one is interpreting, the one interpreting is always already being interpreted, a being in interpretation only because of the possibility of interpretation. And tuning in once again, once again to Werner, if the one who activates interpretation is unhinged, so too is the interpretation as an act. The interpretation is not performative. It is not an act in the sense of praxis performed by a subject, nor is it the deed of an empirical or transcendental doer, whether this doer is called will, grammar, or faith. Rather, interpretation is the apparatic, the self-missing, premise of every possible performation, a pre- and mis-performation. It is no being, it is not a trans-historical substance, but a becoming without goal or ground, at the limit of itself, neither act nor faith, neither act nor fact, but with all the unresolved tension this concept connotes, an affect. Interpretation is, in short, the word for the aporia of interpretation, for the experience of a non-subjective process turning into a subject, and the experience is itself an apparatic one, hence an affect because only at the point where a subject is, n is not yet, and will never be, is it possible to undergo the experience of a still outstanding experience, the experience of an impossible experience, and thus the experience of the impossibility of the aporia of experience. Thus, interpretation is the promise of the possibility of interpretation, keeping in mind that promising means nothing else, a promise of the mere possibility of making promises. Thus, interpretation is premised on the promise, a promise that is hinged on the possibility of nothing but the possibility of interpretation. Which is not to say that the one who is promising is not responsible for the promise. For if it is premised on interpretation, the promise cannot exist without the subject, the I, who utters that promise, a promise that cannot be unless she interprets it as such. And here, we return to Hamacher, where he continues, the promise of infinite interpretations makes every particular interpretation, and therefore the very concept of interpretation, contingent. The possibility that the world, the perspective of the will, and interpretation could always be another one and a limit, none at all. This potential of other possibilities that interpretation can never exhaust inscribes an uncontrollable <coughs> alterity into the very concept of interpretation and forbids, strictly speaking, all talk of interpretation itself. Tinged by other interpretations and non-interpretations, every interpretation must also be capable of being something other than interpretation and a limit, no interpretation at all. Every interpretation is exposed to its other and to its not. Each one from the beginning at exposed, interrupted interpretation. Thus, as in interpretation, in language, in thinking as such, we are always <coughs> on a limit, a threshold where the very limit boundary is us. Not in us in the sense of a stable community, but in the very sense of a movement. Through a symbolic agreement that binds, that throws us beyond ourselves, in a momentary interpretive promise, in a momentary promise of interpretation. And if thrown beyond us, outside us, then perhaps always also a moonless hunt haunted by the unknowability of a Dachin, a community that is interpreting itself as a community, even as it is attempting to read its communion into being. Thus a community that is attempting to write itself, author itself as a community, as it is reading itself. And since the community is composed of nothing more than the ones in the relation with each other, this suggests that the site of authoring is their very body. Hence the authors and readers of the community are indistinguishable. And it is perhaps in this threshold that lies the very possibility of the community itself. It is in this space, the gap with, that allows the movement between writing and reading, on which the coming together and breaking apart of the symbol can take place. 
But once we open the dossier that the bo that bodies of the sites on, perhaps in which the communion is inscribed, we must once again reopen, readjust our receptors to Nietzsche's warning. For if written onto our habitus, there is also always the possibility that the community, no matter how unstable, continually changing it is, becomes a mere habit, and in this way becomes nothing more than dogma, which is precisely what Stengers attempts to warn her audience of. The fact that thinking has been reduced to academically acceptable, blindly normative frames, where what is lost, what we have been cut off from, is the possibility of taking ideas and their adventure seriously. For once this happens, what is destroyed is the very indiscernibility that is required for interpretation, <coughs> the very basis of the possibility of community itself. Thus the moment the community of scientists knows, or thinks it knows, what science is, the community itself dissolves. Thus in order to maintain, think itself as community, the scientific community not only has to continually interpret, write, read itself, it has also to be imagining, reimagining what science is. Which is not to say that nothing is done. Of course much is, and with effects on the world, and the bodies of the people in the world. But that each time something is done, each time there is the movement from imagining science to doing something with it, there is a leap of faith taken. Not just in the outcome of the action, but in what science itself is. Which also means that each time the community does something, enacts something in its name, it ruptures itself as community. For in reimagining the sciences, it is always also rewriting what the community of sciences, of scientists, and hence what community itself is. It is thus a community that cannot avow to what it is to be a community. That only comes together, communes, in the very moment it writes itself, scribbles, scribbles, scratches, tears itself apart. An unavowable community. A community dreaming of the possibility of being a community. Perhaps then, a dream community. Which is why we return and attend to Isabel Stengers and her vigour in proclaiming, I vitally need such a dream, such a story which never happened. And a dream in the sense of something unknown, something slightly beyond the boundaries, binds of what is known. For one must not forget that to begin to dream of something, it must first be within one's consciousness. If it was completely beyond one, one would not even be able to conceive of its dreamability. However, if it was completely within one's cognition, it is also no longer in the realm of a dream. It would merely be a prelude to an attempted actualization. Whether it can or cannot be actualized is perhaps irrelevant. Thus, for it to be a dream, it has for it to be dreamt, it has to be both known and yet unknown at exactly the same time. Or echoing Arthur Schnitzel and his eloquent formulation in his novella Dream Novel or Dream Story. Just as I am sure that the reality of one night, let alone that of a whole lifetime, is not the, the whole truth, no dream is just a dream. Which suggests that the story which never happened is not a tale outside, a tale completely exterior, ulterior to what has happened, is happening, but rather a never happened within what is happening, has happened. In other words, this story which never happened is what has been forgotten in memory itself and unknowability within what is known. Which is why Stengus's attempt to conceive of the community of scientists is not transcending the particularities of the so-called modern tradition, rather thinking with this particularity, rather trying to induce the capacity to imagine a possibility that it can be regenerated or civilized, which does not mean universalized. Rather, on the contrary, it means thinking with its own specific and dangerous, never innocent ways of weaving relations with the resources, imaginative, scientific, political, it may be able to activate in order to think with other peoples and natures. It is about attempting to respond with, whilst remembering that cosmopolitics has nothing to do with the miracle of decisions that puts everyone into agreement. It rather concerns the demand that decisions be taken in full and vivid awareness of their consequences. Which is not to say that one can know in advance what the effects of one's decisions are, but that one accepts the responsibility for the decision, for the unknown in the decision, for what has been forgotten in them. For this is the way in which decisions maintain an unknowability within, maintain the question within, the momentary response answers even that decisions are.
whilst never trying to forget that the question, along with the quest it opens, perhaps brings with it, is the very hallmark of science itself. And this brings us back to the, the very beginning, to the question that we, for now that you are listening and reading, you are part of this particular communion, that we open without actually opening the question of <coughs> what or whom exactly is this Gaia? After all, in order to compose with Gaia, one has to at least momentarily have a notion of Gaia. But this is precisely what one has to resist, if one takes the notion of responsing, responding with Gaia seriously. For the moment one has an idea of what or whom she is, it is over. This is, of course, an impossibility in itself. For if one has absolutely no idea what or whom one is responding to or with, one cannot then, cannot even respond in the first place. Which might be perhaps why Tracy Bonham's Echoes of Two Mothers is crucial to us. If only to remind us that each time we respond to, with, mother, there is always already another mother. Somewhere there, somewhere beyond, perhaps within the first mother. A repetition that is the same, and that is somewhat same, same, but different. Which might be why there is no other way to end but to echo Stengel's. Read aloud Isabel Stengel's whilst holding on to the possible impossibility that her words are also mine. What I have told you is just a tale, which as such can certainly not hope to make a difference, but it calls for other tales. Perhaps then, an ending that begs your indulgence to restart, begin anew, read again, whilst continually attempting to attend to Isabel Stengus's call to dream, call to dream which attempts to maintain the dream of this community of readers, listeners, who are attempting to listen to a dream. A dream of thinking with. Perhaps we can even call it a dream of momentarily being in communion with Isabel Stengus. A dream which dreams the possibility of picking up Stengus's call, accepting her gift even when the fact of it being given remains unknown, which attempts to steal away, perhaps even pilfer her voice and take flight all whilst attempting to be faithful, attempting to listen to the cadence, sound, echoing, perhaps only through an act of attending, reading, rewriting, always already risking infidelity to her voice, whilst never quite knowing if it is even her voice, or just a sound, glum, or as Tracy Bonner might say, I'm losing my mind, everything is fine. Resounding with echoes, with the spirit of Jean Genet and his warning. All of this is only meaningful if I know that what I have just spoken is false. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank I was really impressed by the kind of the, the rhythmic, like the, the return of the of the sense of intertwining and and um, being um, interpretation and things that kind of continually kind of interweave. Mm -hmm.